This journey started seven years ago when I met Vicki. From the moment we met, I felt she reminded me of my Aunt Pam who had lost her fight with breast cancer when I was just 15, so I felt a connection to her right away. Within a year, she was also diagnosed with breast cancer. After losing my aunt, I had always vowed that I wanted to someday get involved with the cause. So when Vicki mentioned wanting to share her story, I jumped on board right away. We started the Pink Time Facebook page about five years ago. The whole experience brought us very close, but the part that still gives me the chills is that Vicki had always made reference to the fact that our journey together was not over and that she felt something much bigger was in store for the two of us. Her intuitions were correct. The copy in the upper right hand corner, drawn together by pinkness, was placed at the time this shot was taken and now serves as an eerie reminder that even then we knew there was something much bigger that tied our hearts together. My name is Tammy Myers. On February 16th, 2015, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I was 33 years old. I had no family history of breast cancer and no environmental risk factors, so it caught us off guard. From day one, I decided that I was gonna do what I believe my Aunt Pam and Vicki would have done if they would have had my resources. I wanted to document and share my journey as it unfolded and try to turn my negative into somebody else's positive. Without putting any thought into it at all, I had emailed Sam from Shutter Sam Photography and asked if she would be willing to help me visually document my journey. I didn't really know her at the time, but we had met at a bridal show earlier in the year and I fell in love with her emotional style. She responded within minutes and said that she would be honored to be a part of this. I remember my heart racing when I read her response. I was definitely panicking a bit when I told my husband what I had just set into motion. He kind of laughed and they of course reminded me that I said I actually wanted to take a step back for the first time in my life and just let this journey take me wherever I was meant to go. From that point, I started documenting my journey on Facebook as uh, Sam and Jordan started taking photos of the raw details. I had worked with Vicki to create my pink time as a way to share her story. So it just seemed fitting that my own journey would be phase two of that collaboration. That's when my personal pink time was born. I found the lump myself. Um, I didn't call the doctor right away because I didn't really think this would ever happen to me. After a few weeks passed, uh, I couldn't get it out of my head, so I knew I had to make the call. I remember feeling like my heart was gonna jump out of my chest as my gynecologist um, examined my breast. She said that because of my age alone, most doctors would suggest watching it for six months, but because she had a family history of breast cancer herself, she wasn't gonna take any chances with me. She suggested I have an ultrasound and said that she would be in touch soon. I got a call from her that night and an email from her the following morning, so I knew she was a bit concerned. She said that she talked to a radiologist and that they felt I needed to have an ultrasound, a mammogram, and potentially a biopsy right away to rule out cancer. The following morning, I got a call to set everything up. I remember my heart sinking into my stomach when she announced that she was calling from Lemon Holton Cancer Pavilion. I met my friend Sarah at Lemon Holton the next day. Looking back, I probably should have realized that I had bad news coming because everyone that treated me got a bit teary-eyed. It was all happening really fast, but it seemed like an eternity at the same time. I started with an initial breast exam and was then sent to a separate waiting room. I was the youngest female in the room. I remember looking around and seeing women over 40 casually waiting for their yearly mammograms, but also seeing women with fear on their faces. None of it seemed real. It felt like a dream. I had been sitting there for a few minutes waiting for my ultrasound when a young technician came to get me for a mammogram instead. She looked like she was going to cry, but I told myself that she was just having a bad day and somehow stayed optimistic. After we finished my scans, my friend Sarah joined me in the waiting room. We talked about how this was just a big scare, we cracked jokes, and even made small talk. I was then asked to head back for an additional 3D mammogram. Before I could even sit down again, another technician came to get me for my ultrasound. She was really upbeat and cheery, unlike my first technician, but I still sensed something in her eyes. She casually talked to me about my day as she started to run the wand over my breast. 
As I stared at the eerie photo of a cherry blossom tree and the ceiling tile above me, I started to realize that she was seeing something concerning. She said she needed to talk to the radiologist and that she'd be right back. I sensed a bit of panic in her voice, but she tried desperately to make it seem like this was a routine part of the process. She was gone at least 15 minutes. I distracted myself by making lists in my head and planning out dinner, but deep down I was starting to realize what was happening. In the days leading up to this, I was kind of a mess, and I did actually break down and cry while telling my sister, but I quickly went into planning mom mode. When you're told that it's possible you could have cancer, the only thing that you can think about is the fact that you're gonna die. I, I don't really remember fearing cancer, but I was absolutely terrified that I could leave my two-year-old without a mommy and my husband without a wife. I started making lists of all the things I needed to do in order to make sure Corinne grew up knowing how much I loved her. There was a lot of things I wanted to do, but I knew for sure I was gonna make out birthday cards for every year, uh, her first crush, her first breakup, and of course her wedding day. My mind literally had been going a mile a minute until this exact moment, and then all of a sudden it hit me how real this actually was, and a strange calmness came over my body. I was no longer panicking or even thinking the worst, but I did kind of have to put a brave face on and mentally prepare for what was about to smack me in the face. When my technician came back into the room, she told me that the radiologist wanted to see me in his office because he preferred his computer screens. She then asked if there was anyone with me that could join me in his office. I remember this moment so vividly. I calmly, but kind of bluntly asked her if I needed to have someone with me. Her eyes welled up with tears as she struggled to say, the doctor thinks this is serious. I cut her off. I told her that I had a friend in the waiting room and her name was Sarah. Everything after this moment is kind of a blur. I know I was still alone when I was led into the radiologist's office. My scans lined the whole back wall on huge monitors. He asked me to sit down and then he struggled to say what I knew he had to say. His words jumped around a bit as he talked about different things that he found on my scans while giving me what seemed like no information at all. And then the words just came out of his mouth. He said, I think this is serious. I think you have two forms of breast cancer. I remember feeling like I couldn't catch my breath and then feeling the arms of both my nurse and my friend on my back. The next thing I know, we were all in another room. I remember asking if there was any way that he could be wrong. My nurse looked at me with teary eyes and said, we're pretty sure he's not, but medical miracles do happen. I think this is the point where I mentally checked out and my mind went numb. I could tell Sarah was emotional, but she was calm and she quickly went into help mode. She started writing down every detail that came out of the nurse's mouth. I remember her saying, you're so young, you're the same age as my daughter and you deserve the best. We kept talking for what seemed like hours until there wasn't really much left to say, just blank stares and comforting hugs. At this point, we had been there for over four hours, so they had to push my biopsy to the following morning. The hardest part was that I now had to share this news with my husband and my parents. My parents traveled across the state to come with me to the hospital the next day. I was told they were going to biopsy three areas and a lymph node if they could, uh, but I really didn't know what to expect. I was oddly doing okay, but Jordan and my parents were a wreck. I remember my nurse kneeling at my feet and holding my hand as she explained the procedure. She started to tell me about the radiologist and how amazing she is. She said that Dr. Cruiser would talk me through the entire biopsy process and that she would be there with me the entire time. It's gonna sound really weird, but being in a room for an hour with these three women was such a great distraction to the reality I was facing with my family. We were laughing the whole time. We joked about embarrassing MRIs talked about our kids, and the fact that Dr. Cruiser and I not only shared the same first name, but also went on the same honeymoon in Greece. I had just met these women, but I felt like I had known them my entire life. I think she took about eight samples of my breast tissue and three to four samples of a lymph node. The incisions were pretty small. She used an ultrasound device to locate each area and then used a needle to numb it before inserting a probe-like tool that made a loud snap with each sample she took. It was kind of painful, but Dr. Cruiser was amazing. She was so calm, gentle, and sweet. 
I remember asking her if she could tell me what she was seeing. Her voice cracked a bit as she calmly said, I'm pretty certain we're dealing with cancer. I remember pausing for a moment to let it sink in and then just saying, okay. Both Dr. Cruiser and my nurse Jan were very much with me in the moment. I never really felt alone. Getting this kind of news is never good, but I feel so blessed to have had them both by my side. And I feel really lucky that I can now call them friends. After the biopsy, things moved really fast. Within a week, I had undergone genetic testing. I had met with a surgical oncologist, a medical oncologist, a fertility specialist, plastic surgeon, and an entire multi-specialty oncology team as a second opinion. The hardest appointment for me was the appointment um, with my plastic surgeon. I remember feeling odd just walking into the building. I wondered if people thought I was there to have cosmetic surgery or if my reality was written all over my face. I was getting used to being exposed at my appointments, but this appointment was different. They had to document all the details of my current breasts in order to ensure that they could recreate them in future surgeries. I felt pretty comfortable with both my nurse Sam and Dr. Timmick, but they were after all planning to remove a body part that makes most women feel feminine. So this appointment was pretty difficult. I was asked to remove everything from the waist up and stand on a footstool facing forward. Dr. Timmick went over all the details and made exact measurements while Sam documented everything on a diagram of my upper torso. I remember gazing out the window in an attempt to tune it all out so I didn't have to hear them talking about breast size, stretching of the skin, or even the mentioning of sagging. When you're dealing with breast cancer, reconstruction isn't exactly an elective surgery. It's actually the biggest part of the process that helps you feel whole again. The hardest part was hearing someone critique part of my body that I was about to lose. I left Dr. Timmick's office with a surgical mapping drawn on my chest. As we drove to meet my photographer at the house, I couldn't stop thinking about how hard this appointment was for me. That's when I decided I didn't want to hold back. I was going to document all the raw and real aspects of this journey. I felt that if I could help someone else going through the same hell, then all of this would somehow be worth it. I spent the next few days reapplying my surgical mapping and spending as much time as possible with friends and family. My bilateral mastectomy took place on March 2nd at Spectrum Butterworth. I had my friend Sarah and my family with me that day. We made small talk and joked around a bit as they prepped me for surgery, but my family definitely teared up as they wheeled me down the hall. The anesthesiologist assured me I wouldn't remember anything past this point, but I have very vivid memories of being wheeled into the OR. The temperature seemed to drop 10 degrees as I entered the room. I've never been in a room so bright. There were what seemed like a dozen people in surgical gear buzzing around me. I remember thinking that the OR actually looked a lot like it does on TV, just way brighter. As they lifted me onto the cold and narrow operating room table and began to strap my legs down, I remember saying that I felt like I was being strapped to an execution table. I think it was the meds talking because it's not something I would usually say in that moment. As they were telling me to lay back with my arms stretched to either side, I looked up and saw Dr. Melnick sitting on a stool about five feet in front of me all scrubbed and ready to go. My eyes locked on hers and everything seemed to stand still. I fell in love with her right away. She was kind, caring, and compassionate, but as a surgeon, I think she has to keep more of an emotional distance. Things changed in that moment though, and I felt a much stronger connection. She looked at me with her loving mom eyes, slowly nodding her head, as if she was telling me that everything was gonna be okay. It was exactly what I needed. The surgery took about five and a half hours and I spent about two to three hours in recovery, so it was quite a while before my family got to see that I was okay. I woke up to find my beautiful friend Sarah smiling down on me. The look on her face said it all. She was in for the long haul. I came home from the hospital with two very large incisions, pain grenades that had been placed into my back behind each breast and drainage tubes coming out of both my sides but knowing we took the most drastic measure possible made me hopeful. I was diagnosed with invasive ductal carcinoma. They found five lesions in my left breast and none in my right, as well as isolated cancer cells on my lymph node. The good news is that they're saying we caught it early. 
All five lesions were stage one to two with varying grades and tested hormone positive and HER2 negative, which I'm told is good. This was a difficult day for me. I was told in the beginning that I may not have to endure chemotherapy and I had held on to that hope, but the pathology reports showed that I would need extensive treatment. I can still feel my heart sinking in my stomach as Dr. Melick opened the folder and said the words, your oncotype testing came back high, so you're gonna need both chemo and radiation treatments. All of this meant that my recurrence risk was high and I would need 18 chemo treatments over the course of six months, 28 consecutive radiation treatments, and 10 years of hormone therapy. This also happened to be the day that my blog went viral. I was contacted by Fox 17 News that night, and within an hour, they were at my house with a camera crew. 33-year-old Tammy Meyer says, after feeling a lump on her breast last month, she decided to make a doctor's appointment. After several tests, she was given the answer she feared the most, that she did in fact have cancer. I would like for 2015 to be the bad year and good things to come in 2016. Obviously, I have a two-year-old, so I don't, I'm not planning on going anywhere soon. Focusing on a positive outlet, Myers created this Facebook page, posting pictures on hospital beds and bringing to light the experiences so many women go through when diagnosed with breast cancer. Everything from finding the lump to the first appointment, the second appointment, the biopsies, the doctors and nurses I've connected with. Without a history of cancer in her family, and at just 33 years old, Myers says she's keeping up a brave face to stay positive for her two-year-old daughter and her husband. If I'm able to be strong right now, maybe I could help somebody else. And that helps me. Knowing she has a long journey ahead of her that will include chemo and radiation therapies, Meyer says she's going to continue to post her journey online for the world to see. I can walk around right now and I can do myself up like I'm totally normal and healthy and no one knows what's going on unless I tell them. But the second I lose my hair, and I walk into a hospital or a restaurant or a bookstore, people know and they look at you differently and it's not, a, it's not in a negative way. Her online posts are already getting attention with people she's never met reaching out to her, letting her know how grateful they are that she's embracing her own struggle. One of the biggest lessons I've learned from Vicki and from my own experience is that by helping others, I'm also helping myself. There's a silver lining in all of this negative. I'm opening up in ways that I never thought possible and becoming someone that I never thought I could be. And I'm meeting so many special people along the way. One of the biggest hits beyond finding out that I had breast cancer was finding out that I wouldn't be able to have another child. Jordan and I had been planning a 2015 baby, so this was very top of mind for both of us. As I asked the question, I may have looked calm on the outside, but on the inside I was a wreck. I have been planning baby number two since Kern was born. Talking names picked out, nursery designed in my head kind of planning. Secretly I've even purchased a few things. I could tell by the look on Dr. Melnick's face that I wasn't going to like what she had to say, but I tried to be strong. My cancer is hormone positive, which means hormones in my body actually feed the cancer. So the plan even before knowing I needed both chemo and radiation was to use a monthly injection called Zolodex to basically put my body into very early menopause for at least five years, most likely 10. This rids my body of hormones, which is my best treatment option. I was told that after five years, I could try to become pregnant with another baby, but my chances of conceiving would be pretty low. And if I was able to become pregnant, it would greatly increase my risk of a recurrence. I knew in that moment that not only would I never nurse another child, but I would never experience a pregnancy of my own again either. It was actually suggested that I have a hysterectomy following treatment to further reduce my risk. I was given the name of Dr. William Dodds, who started the Fertility Center here in West Michigan, and told that although he was really hard to get into, he is the best in his field. If anyone could help me, both doctors were saying that he could. I was told that the only way I could have another biological child would be to do an emergency egg harvest and IVF process before the treatment even began and have a surrogate carry our child. This was a little scary because I would be pumping my body full of the hormones that fed my cancer. But my oncologist was on board because she planned to be really aggressive with my surgery. 
After a few days of going back and forth, we decided that we wanted to at least have the option to have another child if we find that I'm in a good place in a few years. The week after my double mastectomy, we started the process of what they call an emergency egg harvest through the fertility center. Basically, they condensed what a normal woman who is trying to conceive does in three to four months in about eight to 10 days for me. I had to administer three injections a day along with oral medications and have ultrasounds and blood work done every other day to monitor my progress. In a case like mine, you don't really have one doctor. The treatment's so time sensitive that you really just see who you can see on that day. So I met three of the four doctors at the fertility center and I love them all. I was so grateful for what Dr. Dodds and his team were doing for me, but man was I sick during this process. I was in and out of the hospital, and my oncologist actually admitted that in all her years of practice, she's never seen another patient sicker during an emergency egg harvest. I couldn't eat, I couldn't keep food down, and I of course kept passing out. Once my eggs had matured, Dr. Dodds performed the harvesting procedure. I broke his all-time record by producing 58 eggs, with 36 of them being mature. I guess it makes sense that I was so sick. Over the course of the next month, hospital gowns and fall risk bracelets became normal attire for me. I was admitted several times because of severe dehydration and because I kept passing out. I also had a pretty bad infection that took my right tissue expander in a second emergency surgery. Most of this time is a blur to me, but hearing my husband tell the story of the night that he took me in with a blood pressure of 60 over 40 still gives me the chills. Hearing him say that the nurses were yelling code red as they quickly stripped my clothes and shoes off and got the crash cart ready outside the door reminds me of how serious this situation has been. Those first few months were full of difficult and scary appointments, painful procedures, surgeries, and hospital stays. I was doing my best to roll with the punches, but I don't really think there's anything that can prepare you for the mental process you go through as you get ready for a treatment like chemotherapy. I knew that I was gonna be feeling pretty awful for the next seven months. I was going to lose my hair, my sense of taste, my appetite, my ability to keep food down, my energy level, and in some cases, even my ability to think on the spot. But most of all, the physical changes meant that I would also lose my ability to hide what was happening to me, which was probably the hardest thing for me. My first chemo treatment was April 27th. I was still awake when my alarm went off that morning. I met my biopsy nurse, Jan, outside the infusion center. With her morning coffee in hand, she hugged me like a lost sister. I hadn't really fully cried at this point, but in that moment, tears definitely ran down my face and I admitted for the first time that I was scared. Chemo days lasted about eight or nine hours, but seemed to go by really fast. It actually wasn't as scary as I thought it would be because I always had so much fun chatting with my nurses and with all the visitors that had been dropping in. I usually didn't get sick until the third day, but no matter what, I refused to shut myself up in my bedroom. I didn't like to be alone with my thoughts and I really didn't want to give in to the cancer and let the treatment get me down. I decided that if I was going to lose my hair, I was at least going to donate it. My stylist, Adrian from Peer Salon, did the honors. The moment was pretty scary, but I was surrounded by friends that loved me, and although I thought I actually might break down and cry, I didn't. Instead, I had fun with it. I was lifted by those surrounding me with love and support, and I actually felt empowered. Looking back at the photos, I'm realizing that the moment I feared the most was actually the moment that was hardest for my husband. I think seeing me lose such a big piece of myself made him realize how real this was. After losing my hair, we tied my newly shaved head up in a pale pink scarf and uh, headed out to our first breast cancer event at Gilda's Club in Grand Rapids. In the beginning, I didn't fear radiation in the way I feared chemo but I will admit that I had a lot of anxiety the day before my first appointment. Hearing my radiation oncologist say that the cancer-killing radiation would help kill my cancer, but that it could also cause serious complications with my heart later on, kind of felt like I was starting all over again. The daily treatments were pretty quick, but they were involved. I had to lay on a cold, elevated table with my arms placed directly above my head and especially made cast of my upper body, 
and my feet were tied together with a rubber band. I remember trying to visualize the cancer leaving my body as I watched the machine move around me. I was pretty fatigued during these treatments and I had some pretty bad burning on my chest, under my arm, and on my shoulder blade where the radiation exited my body, but it was still easier than chemo. One of the biggest struggles in the beginning was the strain that the cancer diagnosis put on my marriage. The love was always there, but we seemed to be moving in different directions. I was really optimistic, hopeful, and uh, determined, where my husband seemed lost and almost defeated. It took a while before things turned around for us, but he did become the rock that I needed him to be, and I do believe that our love is stronger because of it. I have come to realize that we both needed to face what was happening to me separately before we could face it together. I didn't really start to have fears or negative thoughts until about halfway through my chemo treatments. One of the hardest parts was the loneliness I felt as I tried to pick up the pieces of my former self and move forward with a me that I didn't really know yet. All of a sudden, even mentioning the word cancer seemed to bring tears to my eyes and send me into an emotional tailspin. I couldn't stop fearing that my cancer was going to return and take me away from my family. Cancer was everywhere. It consumed my world. I couldn't listen to stories about others facing cancer. I didn't like watching TV or movies because of the cancer references. I had a hard time shooting my weddings because I feared I would not see my own daughter marry. I couldn't even read the news or search Facebook because cancer stories seemed to fill my feed. I think these were my darkest days. Sometimes I don't even know how I made it through it. I'm learning that I will never fully get away from cancer references and sad stories, but more importantly, I'm learning that the fear that comes with a cancer diagnosis will always be a part of my life. I just have to try not to let it take over my world, or at least not let it take over my world for too long. It may sound odd, but I actually think the hardest part emotionally came after finishing my chemo and radiation treatments. My hair, my eyebrows, and even my eyelashes were starting to come back. So on the outside, I'm starting to look somewhat healthy again, which makes everyone think that I'm actually feeling really good. The truth is I'm still dealing with some pretty extreme fatigue, shortness of breath, surgical pain, joint pain, and overall crummy feeling side effects from the hormone therapy. The only difference is I no longer feel like I have a reason to feel sick. I know it sounds crazy, but there's a big part of me that actually wishes I was still getting treatments because at least then I would feel like I was actively fighting the cancer. In some ways, it's hard to believe that my hardest treatments are completed and that I'm again on to the surgery phase. Yet at the same time, it feels as if time has literally stood still since February 16th when I received my diagnosis and my life changed forever. It's a hard thought to put into words, but it's almost as if I have been frozen in time on this horrible treatment carousel while the seasons changed and life went on around me. At this point, I'm doing my best to move forward in what has become my new normal. I'm not really bothered by my drastic physical changes and I am working through the fears, but I do think that I am subconsciously mourning the loss of my past somewhat carefree self. The truth is, I'm not the same person that I was before cancer, and I never will be, but maybe that's a good thing too. Cancer has and is taking a lot from me, but it has also given me a new and better perspective on life. The next year holds more surgeries and recoveries for me, but I'm staying positive and looking forward to checking these things off my list and starting the process of taking my life back. I'm learning to be present again, to laugh again, to have fun again, and most importantly, to live. Although that awful C word will forever be lurking in my mind, I now see the good in this very scary situation. I've made peace with where I am right now, and I've made some pretty amazing friends along the way. I truly believe it has made me a better and stronger version of myself. I don't think you really ever know how much you are loved until you get sick. A community of people have rallied around me, lifting me at every pass. In the early stages, cards, flowers, gifts, and meals were delivered every day, even from people I had never met. I really don't think I will ever be able to fully thank all of the people who have been surrounding me over the past year, 
but I know that I couldn't have done any of this without them. In the words of Vicky, I am now embracing my pinkness. From the moment I heard the words, I think this is breast cancer, a certain calmness came over my entire body and I felt completely surrounded by hope. A few months back, I was asked to be a part of a Making Strides Against Breast Cancer video that highlighted what the word pink meant to those of us who have faced breast cancer here in West Michigan. At the time, the word pink did symbolize a great deal for me because I was going through the hardest of my treatments. But I don't really think I understood how impactful the color itself was until the Making Strides Against Breast Cancer walk this past October. The entire day was amazing. I was surrounded by my family, my friends, and a community of supporters who have walked this path with me. As we started the walk, a sea of pink lined the streets of Grand Rapids, and I realized that seeing a pink ribbon no longer triggered the fear of my reality. In fact, the color itself has almost taken on a whole new emotion and lifted me up. It now serves as a reminder that I am not alone in this fight, and most importantly, it reminds me that I can win.